What's poppin' everybody? Welcome back to the channel. It's KB and we locked in, now let's jump into it. Today, we're gonna be talking about Young Dolph, a South Memphis rap legend, his life story, and how it all tragically came to an end. We're gonna explore his rise from the trenches to the top of the rap game, all of the controversies that he was involved in, all of the good that he did while he was here, and the theories about why he died. This is gonna be a crazy one, y'all, but I promise it'll be worth it. So without further ado, let's go. On November 17, 2021, around noon, Memphis police responded to a shooting at Makita's Bakery in South Memphis. Upon arrival, officers discovered a camouflage wrapped Corvette in the parking lot and shattered glass at the storefront due to gunfire. Inside, a man lay lifeless. That man was quickly identified as 36-year-old Memphis rapper Young Dolph. You can, um, they're still trying to see what's going on. You can see now tow trucks are being brought in. Now we do know that, um, we assume, we have heard that um, there are still some vehicles up there that may have been involved in this. I don't know Young Dolph's vehicle, it, it may still be up there. Stores across from the bakery, soon filled with onlookers, many capturing and live streaming the incident. The crowd suspected Dolph's involvement before official reports were even released mainly due to his distinctive Corvette that locals recognize from his frequent social media posts. Can somebody please tell me why the f my driveway look like this? Hold on, it's some more all up in there. I can't get over there, man. Like, what the f guy, like, what, uh, what, uh, 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 what, uh, uh. Dolph showcased his camo rap car collection in the music video for his song, Major. My been in the business smoking more hey. rocks. Hey. Pocket full of mother Blue, blue, guac. guac. Half an ounce in my Gucci tube. Two socks. socks. For the summertime, got a new what? drop. Stop. Huh? Foes on the Mercedes. That's major. Uh, uh. Whole gang going crazy. That's major. Uh, uh. Millions on the table. That's major. Uh, uh. I turned dirt into diamonds. That's major. Additionally, a video circulated around on social media that captured Dolph at a gas station earlier that day in the exact same Corvette that was found at Makita's. Confirmation of Dolph's involvement came as people saw tow trucks which revealed that Dolph often visited the bakery to buy cookies for his mother and his family whenever he was in town. And just days before the shooting, the store posted social media that young Dolph made a point to uh, stop by on a regular basis. It hit us in a way that you guys can even imagine. Cause like I said, he was considered a brother. That man did not deserve that. He was just in there to buy cookies for his family. Footage even began to surface of Dolph at the bakery where he was fatally shot at before it all went down, kind of giving them a shout out and promoting their cookies. It again, so you had to get some wood. That's all I came for get some Makita. Oh, Makita cook. Get the side. Get the side. Get the side. Get the side. Come back around. Come back around there. Yes. What you get? Chocolate yeah. chill. Don't hide, hide. Straight out the oven. Just for you. Appreciate you, but be safe. Yeah. Rumors suggest that Dolph returned in the aftermath. Speculation arose that rival rappers Black Youngster and Yo Gotti were targeted in retaliation. Alleged incidents involved shootings at Black Youngster's grandmother's house and Yo Gotti's restaurant, but that's something that we'll delve deeper into a little bit later in the video. The Memphis police chief held a press conference urging residents to stay at home unless necessary and announcing increased police presence throughout the city to prevent any type of retaliatory attacks. Tonight, we strongly encourage everyone to stay home if you do not have to be out. We also strongly encourage everyone to remain calm as we actively perform our investigation. The Memphis Police Department is providing an increased presence in areas of the city that might be directly impacted by this unfortunate incident. Local leaders call for a citywide curfew to protect public safety. A valid concern is more violence erupted soon after the press conference happened. Another man was shot on Lycombe Road, another was shot at a gas station, and yet another was shot at a different location, all within a five mile radius of Makita's bakery, and all in under six hours. A memorial for Dolph was established shortly after the incident, but even this site was unsafe. In a video released online, a gunshot can be heard as fans mourn the loss of Dolph. Memphis police say one person was taken to the hospital, but they should.
The death of Young Dolph was rocking the city of Memphis. And since it all went down, a lot has developed in this story. So let's take a look at what all we know. Young Dolph, born Adolph Thornton Jr., was originally from Chicago, but moved to Castelia Heights, a neighborhood in South Memphis, as a baby. Like many rappers who rise to fame and prominence, Dolph had a challenging upbringing, as corroborated by those that were closest to him. He frequently mentioned in his songs and interviews that both of his parents struggled with drug addiction during his childhood. Like my parents, they was rich, you know what I mean? They was all over the place. Dolph even referred to himself as a certified crack baby, and you can hear this in one of his earliest tracks called Rich Crack Baby. Rich Crack Baby. Rich Crack Baby. Oh, I'm about that paper for real, man. Y'all little just be playing. Hey, I count money with the blood. I count money with the crypts. I cannot f with the fake. Nah. I'm just keeping that real. Hey. Mama had a crack baby. He went got a couple of mil. Growing up, Dolph had a strained relationship with his parents due to their involvement in the streets. As a child, he harbored resentment towards them. Consequently, his grandmother ended up raising him, and she became a significant source of support and guidance throughout his life. What she said the most was, use your common sense. Like she told me every day, when I ask her anything, she's like, use your common sense. You know what I mean? And she was always like, I ain't gonna be here forever, so you ain't gonna, like, she tell me this, I'm like, Eight years old, nine years old, seven years old. I got it. Grandma, like, you just clear me, like, I mean, it's something simple. Like, Grandma, what the, where the, where the garbage bag is at? You just don't sit, like, tell me where the garbage bag is at. But it was just, she was just on it, girl. You know what I mean? And she was just, she put me up on, then taking care of folks. You know what I'm saying? She was always like, I remember before she passed, I was trying to buy a new car. Rest in peace. And she was like, I don't want no damn car. You know what I'm saying? She was like, get your little brother a car. She was always like, instilling in me to do for everybody else. You know what I mean? Like, take care of your little brother. Take care of your mom and dad. I remember I hated my mom and dad. Mm. Like, growing up, I had built like a wall up against them. Like, I really did not like my mom and dad. And like, I ain't like them. All right, like, man, they showed the streets over us. Like, like, yeah, right, facts. You know what I'm saying? But she was like, but she was not with me. Like, but she was like, <laughs> like she could give me the business, bro. Like, like, but you better get your together. You know what I mean? You think that like just the anger that you had towards your parents, like gave you your drive? You like, let me show them. Let me. I think the thing I had towards them was just they were like something personal. Mm -hmm. But like with her. She was always on me so hard, but like, I just felt like she was the meanest person in the world. And she was always like, it was just everything I used to do, but I couldn't do no right. Everything was just a problem, you know what I mean? And I just made it my business, like, to show her, like, I'm like, man, once I get old enough, I'm gonna show her, like, like, you know what I'm saying, I got this, you know what I mean? So once I became a teenager, I started taking care of my little brother, so I, Hit with my mom and dad, you know what I mean? Start paying their bills, start sending my sister you no know, money. Like I started just doing everything. You keep one hundred, I started, I took her place. Right. Everything she was doing, it turned to all of my responsibilities. Despite his challenging upbringing, Dolph was not sheltered from the harsh realities of the street life. In one interview, he recalls knowing what crack was by the age of five. I knew what crack was now probably five years old, six years old, four years old, like that. First time seeing crack, like seeing this on my mom and dad dress is like morning time when they're more and trying to get some money for them to go to school. You know how that be, be like, man, I need some money. I need like $2 or something to go to school. Look, you see that And I'm knowing I, I knew what it was. I had cousins and They cooking it. That was probably like the first introduction of me to drugs. You used to seeing everybody like zombies, like dope things. Uncles, auntie, everywhere. You know what I'm saying? My parents, it was just some common. Damn, man, that shit at these folks. They can't take care of me. They can't do this for me. Can't do that for me. You know what I'm saying? You get to being 
9, 10, 11, 12. You know what I'm saying? You get like, damn, man, they, mom and daddy come pick them up from school, go over one of my friend's house, they folks ain't on dope. His mama make sure he be fresh going to school. His daddy, he play basketball with him. He, he go to games with him. He do this like just the father, the whole parent. But it, it's just a, a big key in the black community that we're missing this and they ain't have that. Even though they had mom and daddy right there, but they wasn't, they weren't able to, to produce. You know what I'm saying? They weren't able to produce. They was there, but they wasn't there. You know what I mean? So that's why the whole play came in with my grandma and them, because she just knew they ain't, they couldn't, they didn't know what they was doing. Doff's determination and self-belief enabled him to rise above his circumstances, transforming adversity into success, as he discussed in this interview. It's just a twist to it, you know what I'm saying? Like rich crack baby, you know what I mean? When you think crack baby, you think all oh, down bad and and sad and f***ed up, you know what I mean? But like, no, you know what I mean? Like we gonna turn this shit around. See, the thing is like, like, like my mama and, and my daddy was using cocaine, you know what I mean? Like they from the, the 70s and 80s. A lot of people in that era were on that, you know what I mean? At first I used to be ashamed of my parents just being like, damn, they on drugs and this and that. But once I got old enough, got 15, the streets is the streets. Some people got to get through that. And it, that's only like a, 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 a four, five percent, you know what I mean? And like, they don't, people don't make it out of the streets, especially when you're talking about cocaine, you know what I mean? Like, that shit don't up the whole black environment. But the whole thing with me was my mom and dad, they got, they got together and they made some special, you know what I'm saying? However, before Dolph achieved success, he faced a devastating loss when the person who helped shape him into the man he became passed away. All her children was her world, but her favorite one was him. His grandma, what I really admired about her, every Sunday morning, she dressed them up. You would thought they were little deacons going to church. She would dress them up and take them to church every Sunday. She made sure they went to church. She made sure they went to school, and he could not disrespect her house because she put his ass out. You know, anybody named out of me, don't play. She loved all of us to death. Even when she had lost her memory, kind of, they asked her, they were like, how many kids you got? She said, three. They're like, yeah, three boys. She was talking about me and my two little brothers. We was her real kids. So she came home from the hospital and my uncle took her key. She had a big Lincoln. My grandma was probably 80 years old. But she going over one of her other old church members' house to clean up their house for them. You know what I'm saying? Or go over one of their house to go take them to their doctor appointment. I just grew up watching her. You know what I mean? Like just taking care of everybody. Make sure everybody's straight. It's like you do good, good, follow you. That just stuck with me. One day she just got up and it's like everything just clicked. When I go in her room, she pulled all her dresser drawers, chest drawers out. She looking for her. She had money here. She's like, where my shit? Where my shit? She's like, she just going out. I was like, oh, shit. I like, grow my back. So my uncle come over here. Like, man, you ain't, you ain't driving no car. How you gonna, he like, come on. You think you can drive? Let's go drive around the corner then. She done put on her roll. They jumped in that big ass Lincoln. She drove his ass around the corner, pulled back up, told his head, get out of them. It's like, she just clicked back and never had no, nothing with her memories again, never again until, like in 2008 when she passed. And when she passed, she had lung cancer. Before she died, she seen me doing good, but as far as like music succession, like just all the real success, she didn't get to see it. Right after she passed, that's when everything took off. Long before his music career, Dolph was a hustler. At just 12 years old, he taught himself how to cut hair and began providing haircuts for everybody in the neighborhood. This entrepreneurial spirit was ignited after his sister delivered a sobering reality check to him. How much did you stack up cutting that hair? And how old was you? Man, I taught myself how to cut hair when I was, I wasn't 12, I was 13. Like 13 years old, I taught myself how to cut hair. So I would come out of the eighth grade, you know what I'm saying? So when I was like 14 years old, like I'm full-fledged chopping. Bro, in the hood, you gotta do something. You know what I mean? Like, me, I couldn't just be a little kid, I couldn't. I couldn't be a little kid. You know, they don't keep it real, bro. My sister. Mm -hmm. 
Man, my sister, <laughs> what? man, I, I, was, I was sitting on the couch, me and my little brother, we were listening to music. My sister came in the house from work, my big sister, and she seen us, she looked at us, and it's like, I don't know what it was, it's just something just sparked on She like, what y'all just gonna sit on the couch, what y'all doing, like, what y'all doing with y'all said, what y'all wanna be, like, what you gonna do, what you gonna be when you grow up, like, shit. Go play ball. She like, so you gonna play ball. She like, you gonna go to the NBA. I'm like, yeah, what the hell? What are you trying to say I can't do? Right. And like, she like, you know what she told me, bro? Literally, her exact words. You better get you some real dreams. Wow. Literally. So what at that point, what did that do to you being that young? You know what I mean? Like, I feel like I had to start doing something right now. When she told me that, I was about, I say 13. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, I was probably about 13. When I had to figure it out. And I was like, man, she ain't nobody gonna be talking to me like that. Hey, you know what I'm saying? So, first thing, I might have been 12, because I start, I taught myself how to cut her. Okay. I was 12 years old, I taught myself how to cut her. Okay. I was cutting everybody her in the neighborhood, everybody her at school. So, you still got skills in okay. it? No. Okay. I, ain't <laughs> you got no hope. I ain't gonna say that. But that lasted for a couple of years right. until I moved on to other hustles. You right. know what I'm saying? Dolph's other ventures, though not as legal as his hairstyling business, proved to be much more profitable for him. I remember him slinging dope. You know, he down there on Ball Street. Bad, he wasn't no bad kid. He was just stayed in the stuff, you know. He was always moving. When 13, 12, 13 years old, man, I started wanting money, my own money, and not just a little money. I ain't want no candy money. You feel what I'm saying? So, 14, 15, I started hustling. 16, I'm full fledged hustling. You know what I'm saying? The streets, but. Like my grandma raised me. I couldn't never, I always been in the streets and doing my thing, but I always had like a certain amount of respect for life, just period. Like I ain't wanna just be out here hustling, but didn't know how to count money or didn't know how to, man, somebody to come through with something for this number or this and that, or like, I wanna be able to, I can, whatever any numbers going on in my head, time, any number, I know what exactly is, how much I'm finna pay, what I'm finna make, all of it. Feel what I'm saying? So like, like, my, like I was saying, like my grandma raised me. I couldn't drop out of school. That wasn't even an option. You feel what I'm saying? So it like, I had to do, I had to keep going to school. You know, I wasn't always in school, didn't have the best grade, none of that, but it was just a point I had to make sure I graduated. And like, man, that's the least you can do. You know what I'm saying? For your grandma just raising you to your little brother, your mom and dad in the streets. You feel what I'm saying? Like, come on, graduate, oh, that's easy. You know what I'm saying? I can go get average throughout the whole thing. Man. I'm like, graduate, got to do that. You know what I'm saying? But 15, 16 years, I'm full-fledged hustling. 13, 14, 12, 13, I'm thinking about hustling. 14, 15, I'm hustling. You know what I'm saying? But 16, I'm dead serious hustling, like full-fledged, like this is what I do. You know what I'm saying? Like, like this is what I do. Like straight up, you know what I'm saying? You can like you know where I'm at all day long. You know exactly what's up with me. Everybody know how that's him. He, yeah, little dude getting it on. Ultimately, the streets were not Dolph's destiny. He transcended the confines of his hometown and rose to prominence, achieving more than anyone could have ever anticipated. Throughout his teenage years, Dolph hustled relentlessly, ultimately breaking into the rap scene in 2008. It was his connections in the streets that paved the way for his musical journey. In fact, he said he only started rapping after he went to sell some green to Lil Boosie in Baton Rouge and seen how hard Boosie was flexing. What made me know that I can do this shit, what made me like, I'm finna rap, I'm finna do this. One of my partners from my hood, he called me, he was like, oh, Finny ready to go pull up on Boosie and smoke some weed with Boosie. He like, Boosie, who such and such, such and such. This Long is story Boosie. short, yeah. This little Boosie before he even went to jail for a while, that, you know what I'm saying? Right. He like, oh, I finna go holler at Boosie, such and such. We go over there, we get to the room. Like, Boosie, like, he one of us, you know what I'm right. saying? Like, this is partner. Like, my boy, he go down to Baton Rouge, he got family down there, so he with him hard. Like, Boosie just showing his ass, he was like, I mean, I first started coming down here, I was getting like 1500 or something. He like, now I'm getting 15000 He like, 
finna get that new Bentley when I get back to Baton Rouge. I'm finna ditch, I'm finna dead. I was like, when well, we left, we in the park, I told my partner, I was like, well, I'm finna start rapping. This story was actually confirmed by Boosie in an interview with DJ Vlad. You know, I motivated Dolph to rap. You know, Dolph, Dolph, I was looking for some weed and Shay called, name Shay called Dolph in 2006, seven. Dolph bought me two ounces. Dolph pulled up, bought me two ounces of weed. I was in my black Bentley. Dolph said this to me. Dolph can't then say this on stage and everything. I was in my black Bentley, he sold me two ounces. And say when I left, he say, man, bro, I'm finna rap. If that nigga can drive a Bentley coupe off rapping, I'm finna rap. A combination of this encounter and encouragement from his friends propelled Dolph to step up to the mic. A local OG named Daddy O helped launch Dolph's career when he finally did decide that he wanted to pursue rap. I had what he wanted, that package. That was my first show me and have me and I like, whatever gun he was on, that's what I was on. So he like, bro, I'm just have you so bossed up and flexed up, but like, ain't nobody gonna be able to tell you. Me and Daddy O just always freestyle, just bullshit. You know what I'm saying? Go ahead and freestyle, freestyle. And so all our partners will come around, they get the freestyle too, but everybody know like, these dead serious freestyle against each other. You know what I'm saying? So everybody like, bro, you need to, you want to go make a song. I got the boy, like, man, I'm make a song. They like, man, bro, you need to do that for real. When I first came with a tape, I was like, damn, they with it. So I went in here and got a real tape together. Like a couple months later, went to an island, this one, the whole DJ hosting thing was going on. The DJ was dropping mixtapes, the whole era. I went down there, I, I pulled my mood at what I was doing. You know what I mean? Got a verse from Two Chain, got a verse from Goo Shit, got DJ Screen to host it, got beats from Drum Boy, beats from Zay Told. I just went down there and went in. And me, I'm gonna do this. Shit. I ain't got time to play with it. Dolph began recording songs way back in 2008. And ever since then, his popularity has skyrocketed. Between 2008 and the present, Dolph released an impressive body of work, including nine studio albums, 20 mixtapes, and a compilation album. It all began when Dolph and Daddy-O committed to making music and taking it seriously and established their business under the name Paper Route Entertainment. They then assembled a street team to support and promote Dolph's burgeoning career. In the latter part of 2008, Dolph released his debut project, Paper Route Campaign, they featured 19 tracks. With an official project to his name, it was time for Dolph and his team to elevate their game and promote it. They printed up over 20,000 copies of this CD and began booking local performances and made sure to distribute the CDs to anybody who would take them at those concerts. They were handing out so many of them that people ended up getting several copies of them, resulting in the bulk of them ending up on the ground. Daddy-O said he had an easy way to make sure that these CDs didn't go to waste though. When it first started, people were throwing the CDs on the ground, and, but still of being like, like, they throwing the CDs on the ground. I'm like, what time the club closed at? What, at three? Go back at four or five and pick the CD back up and pass them out tomorrow. We pass them out so many times, people put them in. Like, I didn't heard people really say, man, listen, y'all done gave me this CD so many times, I'm finna put it in my player right now. And then the same people I bought back into them, bang. That mother bumper, you know what I'm saying? As Dolph gained traction in the local music scene, he started performing at more shows and establishing connections with key players like DJ Rocksteady, which further propelled his career. I was DJing every big major club in the city, literally having 20 guys outside the club in backpacks. Everywhere you go, man, Young Dolph CD, you're going to get a Young Dolph CD. You know, it's you you can try to turn your head and act like you don't see it but as soon as you turn your head, it's gonna be right there you know what i'm saying and that's how it was i just respected this ground for two years Dolph and his team tirelessly promoted the paper route campaign mixtape expanding their following off of it they eventually ventured to atlanta a city renowned for its thriving hip-hop scene where Dolph connected with influential figures like club promoters dj scream and producers like zaytoven Collaborations with well-known artists like Gucci Man, OJ the Juice Man, and Two Chains followed this move. You know, Dolph and I were real cool. I met him. He was a, I was one probably his first feature. Uh, I was in Atlanta, and Drummer Boy called and said, you know, he had an artist that wanted to give me like. At this time, I had him. I was trying like three thousand for a verse, mm -hmm. but he wanted uh, play a circle. He wanted me and Dolph. But you know, like at this time, we um, 
Well, I had started rapping. I think full time. I think Dollar was doing both. You know what I mean? One foot in, one foot out. So I'm like, Dollar, I'm about to go to the studio. And, uh, you know, got this dude from Memphis. He want to spend some money. Bro, like, I got I got a play to make. You know what I'm saying? I'll be down there when I get through. And so I go down there and I'll, I meet, you know, Dog, real cool, cool player from Memphis. You know what I'm saying? Laid back. You know what I'm saying? At this time, we're doing the same things, drinking lean and smoking gas, you know what I'm saying? And like, I just, you know, really rock with his energy. So I did a song with him and I did it so fast and we waiting on Dollar and uh, he, he never came because he was doing whatever he was doing. I ended up doing another verse and I told him I didn't want to get paid for it. Like, However, amidst the rising success, Dolph grappled with personal tribulations that threatened to eclipse his burgeoning career, like this car crash that almost claimed his life. We go to coming back from a video shoot to somebody video shoot I had to go do a video shoot with somebody we just got back to Memphis we dropped one of my partners off we in the truck he was driving the one that was driving we dropped him off my cousin got up smoked a cigarette jumped <laughs> right in the driver's seat jumped in the driver's seat I promise on everything it was less than two minutes I don't know how he fell asleep that fast. He fell asleep? He fell asleep. And like, he hit this, like, this time, him, he fell asleep and ran all the way to the pole and we flipped. Oh, wow. This time, it's four of us in the truck. Oh. I'm like, damn. <laughs> like a time like, round two. I'm talking about, yeah. this time, I'm like, it's four of us. I know all four of us ain't finna get up and walk away from it all good, but by the grace of God, like we did. Despite the ordeal, Doff emerged relatively unscathed and more determined than ever. On July 2nd, 2010, he released his second mixtape, Welcome to Doff World, which was hosted by DJ Scream. With cosigns from 2 Chains and DJ Scream, Doff's credibility started to grow. His first major show after the mixtape's release garnered $5,000, and this is what Doff considered to be his first real show. Well, I went to Atlanta, you know I'm from Memphis, you know what I'm saying, I drove to Memphis. Me and my homeboy, I went down there, I forgot how I even got screen line. I got his line, I don't know from who it was. One of my partners in that line. I can't even think just straight out the top. But I called screen, you know what I'm saying? Screen was like, man, where you at? You feel what I'm saying? I pulled up on screen like, like shout out to screen. You feel what I'm saying? When I got out with screen, he was, he was, he was straight with it. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't no beating around, no push, wasn't no middleman, no nothing. Like we just went in, you know what I'm saying? Like I told him what I'm trying to do, what I need, all that. Man, we put it together, we ran the play. You feel what I'm saying? And that tape, after I dropped that tape, it made me the hottest artist in my city, like straight up. Like I dropped that tape, that welcome to Dark World. It just, it just took fire, just straight fire. My first show I, I did in Memphis after that tape. I dropped that tape, then my first show got five bands. When I was doing it, it's like it was a whole like wave. It wasn't just like a, a thing. It's like it's like a it's like a little stage during my life. You know what I'm saying? And it's a lot of like a couple of my partners. You know what I mean? My boy C, my boy Daddy O, my little brothers. You know what I'm saying? My cousin, like everybody, you know what I'm saying? But at the same time, what this was going on, when I was doing all this, everything to get where I was finna get ready to go, I was telling them I was finna do this. You know what I mean? And every day and every night, I was doing, working towards doing this. So it's like I was already it. You know what I mean? And everybody was just waiting on the time. You know what I'm saying? But once the Finally broke, bro, like broke, and I was like, oh yeah, like this happened, like, oh, it's for sure, it happening now, you know what I'm saying? That's like really, when I did my first show and got paid that 5000 in Memphis, in my city, motherfuckers ain't doing that, you know what I mean? Your first show in your city, the biggest club, popping this club in that city, bro, you get 5000 in your city, like locally. You see what I'm saying? Doff's increasing prominence in Memphis led to collaborations with people like Drummer Boy, who introduced him to Gucci Mane. Although Gucci initially charged Doff for a feature, he later invited him to his studio in Atlanta and considered signing him when the song they made took off. Doff ultimately decided not to sign with Gucci, but that didn't deter Gucci from taking Doff under his wing and mentoring him throughout his career. One of my homeboys came to Atlanta. He was like, I just drove from Mobile. He was like, all I was playing was you and Dolph. So I'm like, me and Dolph. He was like, man, Dolph hard. But I didn't even make the connection with this the dude who I did a feature with maybe a year ago. So I listened to his tape and I was like, damn, he is hard. You know what I'm saying? And then I called Drone Boy and said, hey man, connect me with that dude who I did that feature with. I just heard his tape. 
And I called him, I told him, I said, hey man, you know, I'm just building a studio. Anytime you want to come up here, man, you know, let's just make some music. I never charge you again. And I told him, once I met him and we started being cool and being friends, I told him, hey, man, you know, my door's always open to you. And we just start with each other down there every other day. I like stuff that's real. I like stuff that I, I feel like the artists match the music. You know what I'm saying? And with him, it's like what you see is what you get. When you meet him in person, what you see is what you get. It's like, you know, it, it ain't hard to decipher that, hey, man, what he's telling you is true. Just because you really street or just because you were selling bricks in the trap doesn't necessarily make me want to buy your music. Because if it's garbage, it's garbage. It's a super hard track transition to come from hustling to rapping. In the business world, you gotta really square up and deal with people who know nothing about the streets. They don't understand the streets. It don't translate. Now you gotta switch your whole approach because you'll scare them off if you deal with them like you would deal with somebody in the streets, even if you did square business in the streets. Gucci, that's my dog, that's my partner. You know what I'm saying? My trap brother, like, he, he, he go hard, like I learned a lot from him, you know what I'm saying, like the, based on consistency, you know what I'm saying, like always feeding the fans and doing it right, you feel me, like he makes so much music, like if you don't catch on to it, like, like just being around, you're going to catch on, like man, uh, stay scrapped with that music. With this newfound hustle that he witnessed from Gucci, man, it was time for Dolph to go harder, and in 2011, Dolph released two mixtapes. On May 7, 2011, he unveiled High Class Street Music, featuring his first official collaboration with Gucci Mane on a track called Unbooked Up. The response to this track was overwhelmingly positive. Subsequently, Daddy O and Dolph made a strategic move by rebranding Paper Route Entertainment to Paper Route Empire and continued to supply the streets with fresh music. On November 8, 2011, they launched High Class Street Music 2, Hustler's Paradise. This project showcased unity amongst Memphis artists with people like Juicy J appearing on the lead single, I Think I'm Sprung, which achieved great success. Huh. Hey, bro. Huh. I love you, bro. You sure, I've been on YouTube My looking at you every night, bro. Hey, nigga, we do this shit. Keep going to kill it. Hey, hey, I, 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 that new young dog, I Think I'm Sprung. I'm new city, bro. Sure, Real sure. talk, man. Hey. 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 Real talk. Real talk. I do this shit for y'all, bro, bro. Uh -huh. He had the attention of every Memphis artist that had made it out before him, and that included another rapper named Yo Gotti. However, this situation with Sour, which we'll jump into here in just a little while, but in 2012, Dolph's momentum showed no signs of slowing down. On April 6th, he released a fresh mixtape titled The Time to Kill. Later that year, on November 14th, he unveiled another mixtape called Blue Magic. This release marked the first collaboration between Dolph and Future, as well as other notable artists. That following year, Dolph continued to make waves in the hip-hop scene. In 2013, he joined forces with Gucci Mane again to create a collaborative mixtape, East Atlanta Memphis, which dropped on March 16th. A few months later, on May 13th, Dolph launched his third installment of high-class street music. This release brought Dolph his first real taste of viral fame. The track, Get This Money, featuring 2 Chains, captured the attention of the online community. With Vine's popularity at its peak at the time, users created seven second clips that showcased their dance moves to Dolph's infectious beat. This surge in engagement helped propel Dolph's music to a broader audience and solidify his presence in the hip hop world. Dolph's tireless work ethic continued to pay off as he dropped another mixtape titled South Memphis Kingpin on October 15, 2013. The following year, he tasted his first success on the Billboard charts with the release of Cross Country Trapping on April 15, 2014. This mixtape featured a track titled Preach, which became Dolph's most successful record at the time. This was his first entry into the US main R&B and hip hop charts, peaking at number 24, a significant accomplishment for an independent artist, especially considering that him and his team didn't have the backing of a major record label. Dolph continued to make waves by releasing the fourth installment of high class street music, titled American Gangster, on July 8, 2014. In 2015, his momentum only increased as he gained more recognition on the Billboard charts, not only for his songs, but also for the features that he was contributing to on other people's tracks. Dolph kicked off the year by releasing the fifth installment of High Class Street Music called The Plug's Best Friend on February 24, 2015. The mixtape included a track called Pulled Up that had 2 chains on it, which charted at number 39 on the Billboard Man R&B and Hip Hop charts. Dolph then featured on OT Genesis' hit track, Cut It, which proved to be the most significant track of his career up to that point. 
It peaked at number 35 on the Billboard Hot 100 and number 3 on the US R&B and Hip Hop charts, ultimately going double platinum. Dolph also appeared on Colonial Loud's California track alongside T.I., which peaked at number 32. Capitalizing on the growing success, Dolph continued to release a steady stream of mixtapes, many of them collaborations. On June 30th, 2015, he dropped Felix Brothers with Gucci Mane and Pee Wee Longway. Just a couple of weeks later, on July 15, 2015, he released Bag Man with Pee Wee Longway. Soon after, on July 28, 2015, he released a solo mixtape titled 16 Zips. Within a few months, on October 8, 2015, Dolph unveiled another mixtape titled Shitting on the Industry. A track from this mixtape titled Get Paid quickly gained popularity amongst fans and became the first single off of his debut album, peaking at number 35 on the US main R&B and hip hop charts. However, the track sparked controversy when two Duke University students were fired for playing the song in 2018. Dolph quickly took notice and responded by flying the two employees to his Rolling Loud set in May 2018. As a show of support, he generously brought both of them on stage and gifted each of them $10,000 while in front of the whole crowd. You guys, this store behind me is just one of four stores here in Durham. The one in question is actually two miles away from here on Duke's campus. Tonight, the owner of this store who fired those two workers over rap music says he made a mistake. Joe Van Gogh is sorry. The Triangle Coffee Shop is changing its tune two days after firing two workers over rap music. This is the song Larry Manetta, who is a Duke University VP of Student Affairs, heard Friday while trying to buy coffee at the store's campus location. Chopper 11 flying high and giving you a bird's eye view above the Joe Van Gogh Duke store. According to Manetta, he was shocked by the song's F-bombs and sexually charged lyrics playing inside a business that serves children. Upset, Manetta took his concerns to Duke's dining division, who has a service contract with the owner of Joe Van Gogh. On Monday, two barista workers were terminated from the company. In his defense, Manetta released this statement. It reads in part, the employees who chose to play the song in a business establishment on the Duke campus made a poor decision, which was conveyed to the Joe Van Gogh management. How Joe Van Gogh responded to this matter was solely at their discretion. I know y'all familiar with the situation that happened at Duke University a couple of days ago, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, they fired two workers from a coffee shop for bumping my sh in the stove. Hell no. Nah. Matter of fact, I bought them out here, flew them out here with me, man. Okay. This really? is the kind of I do. Really? Do real I see you, dog. You know what I'm saying? So, keep in mind, this was a VP at Duke University that fired them. It worked for playing the song, Get Paid. So check this out. This is what we gonna do. I know for a fact that that VP at that school, he get money, but he ain't get money like Dolph. Uh-huh. So look, check this out. Until y'all get y'all a new job, till y'all find y'all a new job, I got 20,000 for y'all right now. New tonight, rapper Young Dolph is shelling out $20,000 to two baristas who recently lost their jobs at a Duke coffee shop. It comes after a Duke vice president sounded the alarm after hearing the rapper's profanity-laced music playing at Joe Van Gogh. The two baristas fired after in the aftermath. Tim Pulliam is live at Joe Van Gogh at the location in Chapel Hill tonight with new reaction. Tim? Yeah, Andrea, we are about 10 minutes away from the Duke location of the Joe Van Gogh Coffee. This location is just right around the corner here. Those two fire baristas may no longer need their job after receiving $20,000 cash from rapper Young Dolph on stage last night. Today, the owner of Joe Van Gogh Coffee, who is also the person who fired two baristas this week, is reacting to the cash payout they just received from rapper Young Dolph. Robbie Roberts says, quote, I think it's great that Dolph is giving the baristas $20,000. I am extremely pleased. Roberts apologized for firing Brittany Brown and a fellow coworker this week after receiving a complaint from Duke University's VP of Student Affairs, Larry Moneta. 
and Joe Van Gogh Coffee is ending its relationship with Duke. It will no longer serve coffee on campus. Today, the owner of Joe Van Gogh, Robbie Roberts, says the company made a mistake and through a statement says he is taking steps to make things right. He says in part, we attempted to understand Duke's position in this case, but we should have taken a different approach in making personnel decisions. As the owner of the business, I take full responsibility. And the owner goes on to say that he apologizes to everyone he offended because of the company's action. As for how he plans to remedy this, he says that that is a personnel private matter. The hype surrounding the track get paid was so immense that it gained legendary status. In January of 2016, Dolph took to Instagram to announce that he had to take a little kid into his custody for 24 hours as ordered by the court. The post was especially believable at the time because Dolph was in court on drug related charges, which made many people assume that this story was real. The caption said his mom said he's been skipping school, stealing and shit. In fact, he further amused his fans by posting another picture on Instagram with the kid with the caption that read, why this little badass just tell me this house is cool, but let's go to the other one. I said, what other one? He said, your trap house, duh. I said, don't make me put this belt on your little ass. The humor behind these posts was not lost on Dobbs followers, and it successfully generated even more buzz for the track. The kid even appeared in the music video. Over time, Dolph let the public in on the fact that the whole custody situation was simply a publicity stunt for the single get paid. That's the video. We shot the video. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I shot the video and that was the whole that was the whole storyline of the video. You know what I mean? So he did actually kick it with me and hung with me for like a day and a half, but it wasn't that right. It there. wasn't court, court. ordered. No. Nah. Okay. Oh, I, like, I thought the court, court, yeah, court made you be a mentor or something. No. Nah, I man. think that was the premise of it. Like we said, because when I first seen it, I was like, now nah, I know. Well, that's a good ass video because I believe it. <laughs> 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 but following the success of the single, Dolph was ready to release his debut album, King of Memphis, on February 19, 2016. To his delight, the album charted on the Billboard Top 200 for the first time in his career at number 49 and on the US rap charts at number five. Doff also released another single off the album titled Royalty, which peaked at number 33 on the US main R&B and hip hop charts. But Doff wasn't done yet. He continued to put out music and dropped a collaborative mixtape with Jay Fizzle and Vino Brown on May 27, 2016, titled Bosses and Shooters. Later that year, on August 26th, he released Rich Crack Baby, his first mixtape to chart on the Billboard 200 charts, debuting at number 132. Not bad for a mixtape. Dolph's success in 2016 set the stage for an even more promising 2017, and on February 2nd of that year, he dropped his final mixtape, Gelato, which included the standout track titled Play With Your Chick. This track caused some tension in the streets of Memphis, which again, we'll touch on those here in just a minute, but he did end up getting his car sprayed up in Charlotte, North Carolina. Carolina only two weeks after this song dropped with over 100 bullets riddling his SUV. Recognizing the opportunity to capitalize on the shooting incident, Dolph released his second album titled Bulletproof on April 1st, 2017. The lead single from the album was titled 100 Shots and it was a track that addressed the incident head on. The song would eventually become Dolph's highest charting song on the US R&B and hip hop charts, reaching number 49 and going gold. Interestingly, the track list for Bulletproof appears to be a sentence about the incident. The album starts with the track 100 Shots and features tracks like In Charlotte, But I'm Bulletproof, So F Them, That's How I Feel, All of Them, I'm So Real, I Pray For My Enemies, I'm Everything You Wanna Be, Shaking My Head, or SMH. Despite some initial skepticism about the track list, it turned out to be the real one. While using the incident as a marketing strategy work, I can't really say it was the smartest move considering how this story ends, but again, we're going to jump into all that here in just a little while. On October 20th, 2017, Dolph released his fourth album, Thinking Out Loud. The first week sales of 23,487 copies were particularly impressive, especially for an independent artist. The success of Thinking Out Loud caught the attention of record labels, who began reaching out to Dolph with offers to sign him. In 2018, he revealed that he had been offered a $22 million contract but he chose to decline it. Dolph had a clear understanding of his potential and what he could accomplish independently, leading him to turn down the offer. This was a significant step in growth as just a few years prior, he had been offered a deal for just $3.2 million. 
The fact that he had turned down such a large sum of money demonstrated Dolph's commercial growth and further solidified his status as an independent artist who was capable of achieving success on his own terms. I done got myself in a f***ed up ass situation, dog. I don't know what the f*** to do, dog. You know what I mean? Really, to tell you the truth, I do know what to do, but I'm going to let y'all know what's going on. Bro, for the last six months, I've been having a mother $22 million contract debating on shit I do the deal or not. Know what I'm saying? I'm like, should I take the 22 million? Or the 22 million? The 22 million. <laughs> the most money I done turned down was 3.2 million dollars. Oh. I ain't turned down, I didn't turn down the 3.2. The whole thing, it really was like a label deal, but it's like, I couldn't, I just didn't want to do it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I see something bigger. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, not saying it wouldn't have been a good opportunity, but it's just, it's like, man, I don't feel like I got to go that route. It's just, you know what I mean? It's like, a lot of people, they can't see what I see, bro, because they ain't in my position. And right. I, I figured that out, too. I had to figure it out along the way. Like, a lot of people, they ain't going to get it. They ain't going to see what I see. You know what I'm saying? Because it's like, you look at what I'm at right now. Look what I've done so far. You know what yeah. I'm saying? It's like, ain't nobody was willing to sacrifice, like, holding out to get to where. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm at in their career. You know what I'm saying? Before yeah. they be like, oh, I'm going to do this. and me sign this or do that. Do this. It's just, I just got a, another vision for it. You know what I mean? And it's right. like strictly 100% ownership. You know what I mean? Okay. Your decisions is everything, bro. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like run wrong, one wrong decision. It can lead to, a, a, like, just, like, you know, it can it can lead to so much. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, you know, so like this is just my whole thing. This is my philosophy. They offered me that two, like three years ago. Mm -hmm. So just imagine if with the conversations like right now. Hey man. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. it, it was on some like Master P type stuff where No, it was on some young dog. <laughs> what I mean though, let me say. By Master P, as an, ex an example, before that, he was offered what, 10 million and he turned it down because he said, if you offer me 10, I know I'm really worth. 30, 40. No, I think P said they offered him like a million or two million or yeah. something like that. And but, he was like, him and C Murder left out. He was like, yeah, that, you right, right, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But it wasn't even so much that it was just like, I'm a hustler, you know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? I know that I can leave out this building and go yep. stir up some more and yep. make y'all want to like give me even more up the value. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, I just always been the person that I'm going to always gamble big on myself. This right. is how I was raised, like, Gamble big and win even bigger. On, on IG, you, you 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 talked about how you was pondering. You had this twenty-two million dollar deal in front of you, right? And you just hit up with the famous man for twenty-two million, and it just don't make sense for me to do it. I don't say it didn't make sense for me to do it, but that ain't the option. That ain't the decision that I want to go with. And this was a major labor deal. I just want right. to talk about. Okay, it's hard to say for a lot of people. Most people is gonna take the 22 million. Right. I, I feel like it, it, nine out of 10 people, 9.5 out of the 10 people gonna take that 22 million. I'm in a different position from everybody else. You know what I'm saying? Like that's what people gotta realize is like, even the people that try to give me like advice on it, like I take their advice and I listen to what they say, but it's like at the same time, on this side of my brain, I gotta realize and keep in mind that ain't nobody never been in my position and in my shoes. You know what I'm saying? So they don't know what what's the best move to make or what's the best dish to make. So it's all on me to make the right decision. You know what I mean? Like that ain't something, it's just something I gotta pray about. And I keep doing what I'm doing and just, I'm gonna figure it out. I feel like a couple years ago back and make my own 200 million, you know what I mean? And still have 100% ownership in my company. Right. Dolph continued to stick to his winning formula of dropping new music, and on February 16, 2018, he released a new EP titled People Get Shot Every Day, which peaked at number 59 on the Billboard Hot 200. He then began gearing up to release his fourth studio album and dropped Role Model on September 21, 2018. The album also had the best first week sales of his career at the time, with 31,000 copies sold. You guys seeing a trend here? The lead single off a of role model was Major, featuring Key Glock, which became Dolph's biggest charting song as a lead artist at the time, peaking at number 47 on the US R&B hip hop charts. Dolph's announcement of a challenge for the single called the Major Challenge helped the song perform even better. 
ripped off, offered the camouflaged Hellcat Challenger to the creator of the best video to the song, regardless of the style of video. He ultimately did choose a winner and brought them out so they could meet him. What's up, bro? Yo. <laughs> <laughs> What's happening, bro? <laughs> What's going on, man? <laughs> Right, get back something, guys. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hey, what's happening, man? Yeah. What's happening, man? <laughs> Dude, look at this. You seen it? Nah. Congratulations, first of all, bro. Thank you. Like, you deserve it, like, for real, for real. Putting that energy out here. You know what I'm saying? It's like, don't go good places, but just keep that same energy you got. That's why I like more than anything, bro. Your energy. You can have all this plus more. You know what I mean? Next year. I still feel like I'm dreaming. You feel like you're dreaming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thirty reps for you too. Damn. Bro, you just getting started. <laughs> One of the smartest moves Dolph made to propel his career forward was including his own artist Key Glock on what was his biggest record at the time. This also helped Key Glock skyrocket his own career and start building his own empire. In 2019, Dolph and Key Glock collaborated on a joint project called Dumb and Dumber. This album became Dolph's most successful project to date peaking at number 8 on the Billboard 200 and number 4 on the U.S. rap album charts. The album also had its best first week sales to date, with 36,000 copies being sold. The success of Dumb and Dumber proved that Dolph and Key Glock had great chemistry, which would further benefit both of their careers. Despite the pandemic slowing many people down in 2020, Dolph continued to gear up for his fifth studio album. In early August of 2020, he announced that he would be giving away his blue and tangerine colored Lamborghini Aventador to a fan who purchased something off of his website. Fortunately, a lucky fan did win the car and Dolph personally delivered it to him. In August of 2020, Dolph released his fifth solo studio album, Rich Slave, and it quickly became his highest charting album, debuting at number four on the Billboard 200 and selling 65,000 copies in its first week. As 2021 rolled in, Dolph shifted his focus to promoting his artists that were on the Paper Route Empire label, releasing several collaborative albums throughout the year. The first of these collaborations was Dumb and Dumber 2 with Key Glock, released on March 26, 2021. A few months later, Dolph released the first Paper Route Empire compilation album, Paper Route Illuminati, on July 30th, 2021. Things were going well for Dolph and his record label and his artists and they all continued to rise in fame, success, and prominence. However, on November 17, 2021, everything changed. Dolph had returned to Memphis to get back to his community by handing out turkeys on November 19th for Thanksgiving. Prior to that, on November 15th, he visited the West Cancer Clinic near Memphis to show appreciation to the staff that had took care of cancer patients as many of his family members had been treated there. He took photos, signed autographs, and even participated in an interview. Tragically, no one knew that this would be the last interview with Young Dolph before his untimely passing. I decided to visit West Cancer Center and Clinic today just to show my appreciation for like over the years. I had several family members to come through here and been patients of this clinic, so I just really wanted to show up and show them my support, show them my, my like how thankful I am just for them being them. I got a aunt, my aunt, she's currently here, like she has cancer. My grandmother had cancer, my uncle had cancer, and they all came through these doors. And I just wanted to, I just wanted to show up and just really thank them for what they do, because it's it ain't an easy job, like. It's kind of, it's kind of hard. You know what I mean? Just seeing people in those conditions. Like some people be more down than others. Some of them be all right. It's really just be all about timing. Like even the ones to be all right, it, it's like it only lasts for so long. But they do a hell of a job, and I just wanted to come and congratulate them, and let them know like they appreciate it. In the same week as his final interview, Young Dolph 
was tragically shot and killed at Makita's bakery. His remarkable rise to fame was covered in depth earlier, but his roots in South Memphis proved to be not only his greatest strength, but also his greatest weakness. Before the shooting occurred, Dolph was filming a music video with his artist Snoop Benz. He was seen driving around the city in his camo wrap Corvette before stopping by his favorite cookie shop to pick up some treats for his family. It was at this moment that a white Mercedes Benz pulled up, two men wearing hoodies and masks emerged from it and began firing through the front of the store. They quickly fled the scene in a getaway car. Police arrived in less than 10 minutes, only to pronounce young Dolph dead at the scene. Almost immediately, people began pointing fingers at anybody that young Dolph had feuded with in the past, leading to numerous theories about the tragic event. Some of these theories were purely speculative, while others did seem to have more substance. Nevertheless, the loss of young Dolph left the music world in shock and mourning for a talented artist that's gone too soon. As mentioned earlier, some theories regarding Dolph's murder seem more plausible than others. For instance, some people suspected Soldier Boy might have been involved. This suspicion arose after Dolph posted an Instagram story questioning how he, as an independent artist, could make over $100,000 per show. He also asked how Key Glock had more cars and jewelry than other artists and their CEOs. Soldier Boy responded to this post, claiming that Dolph and Key Glock weren't truly independent as they were signed to Empire, saying that's big cap, they signed to Empire, I'm really 100% independent. Soldier Boy then shared his version of events, stating that Dolph and his associates had sent him threatening messages in the DMs. In response, Soldier Boy addressed the situation in a live video. Man, stop playing, I put a honey ball on the head. Doing all this talking, I still ain't got an address yet though. I bet a hundred thousand dollars you won't give me an address. How about that? I got a hundred K cash. Look, DM me the address. You can have all this on my hand. How about that? How the f Key Glock and Dolphin these is getting the picture? They yeah, snuck in. They snuck in the back door, God. How the f we, we end up talking about Dolph lame man. Snuck in. God, a clout chasing that. It's still cool. This Dolph. Gonna talk about some, I'm an independent, I'm getting a 100K a show. Man, stop it. I get in the mother comments and say, that's cap. Y'all signed to Empire. Y'all not independent. I'm independent. I'm not signed to Empire. I'm not signed to no independent label, no major label. I put my own music out through SODMG Records and get 100% of all the money. Ricky Morty, all the money. I'm really independent. So what the f*** this really about? This get yeah, mad because I come in the comments and say, that's Cap, you signed Empire. What a lie at? Yeah. Is you not signed to Empire? You signed the Empire, you not independent. As soon as I post that, the top in my DM, are oh, you funny? Oh, dude, what's up, dude? Start talking. So they mad that you signed? So they mad that they signed. Come on, man. Dolph mad because he signed the Empire <laughs> and I exposed them. That's what it's really about. You should have shut the f up and kept saying you were independent like that. If you weren't really independent, I wouldn't expose your ass. I'm a real gangster, bro. I really did time, really spent on this. Cut it out, bro. Breakfast club tomorrow. Shout out to Charlemagne and God. Y'all didn't do nothing but gave me some to talk about. I'm talking about breakfast club tomorrow, nigga. And if y'all wanted to be something else, it could be that, nigga. What you talking about? Y'all ain't doing nothing but add me to the op, to the list of ops y'all got already deal with. <laughs> I don't think y'all won't be Draco though, y'all ass too. And don't never say why I can't go, cause I'll come to Memphis right now. But bitch, I'm doing a motherfucking interview, and I'm on tour, and I got shows, and bitch, with y'all, and fuck y'all. And just as he promised in that live video, he also discussed the matter further during an appearance on the Breakfast Club radio show. During the interview, he even mentioned another incident where Dolph had been shot, a situation that we'll discuss shortly. Oh, I thought you told him pull up and smoke then. Man, and I said, they jumped in my DMs and said, wait till we see you. It's this, it's that. I ain't gonna really say what they, but they started it. So yeah, I came yeah, back yeah. like, what? The what? Ain't you the get shot at a hundred times? Oh, no. Ain't you the got no. shot in Hollywood <laughs> out, running all out the LA, out the hotel? Don't go handle the who shot at, shot at you first before you come at me talking about some. You gonna see me. You ain't gonna do to me. You know who the come is? You tripping? Who are you? I don't. Oh, big Draco, I'll go 
by no Dolph, Geek, Key Glock, PR, none of that shit. It is SOD money gang, and we will not tolerate no disrespect from no Then, literally right after Dolph died, Soldier went live again and said this right here. Could get what? If something happened to me, it would have been laughing. So I'm saying, that could have been me. No was threatening me too. How about that? No was in my DM top. If something wouldn't have happened to me, it wouldn't have been no we sound about none of that. What you talking about? I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to say what? I'm supposed to do what? I don't know these out of here it would have been me it, it would have been a whole bunch of ha 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 soldier boy he should have kept his mouth shut he should have did it let it would have been me y'all should have shut the fuck up what you talking about y'all should not get on my dm talking crazy jump on my dm talking crazy now y'all gonna be uh, should have shut the fuck up ultimately soldier boy wasn't responsible for Dolph's murder and the theory linking him to the crime was simply a result of people misinterpreting Soldier's content for Dolph overall as a person. In reality, Soldier Boy was one of the least likely suspects. Dolph was a person whose music and persona helped shape the 2010s, not only in the Memphis rap scene, but in the whole US. Dolph was one of the few, if not the only artist to make it to the top of the game by doing things his way and retaining ownership of his craft not needing to answer to any type of record label or person about how he did things. This is what made him a target for many in the industry and in the streets. Which brings us to the next person that everybody focused on as a prime suspect in this case, and that's Yo Gotti. Yo Gotti and Young Dolph share a lengthy history that goes back to the early 2010s when Dolph first gained popularity. Both artists are from Memphis, with Yo Gotti already making his name for himself in the city before Dolph ever emerged onto the scene. Although they came from different neighborhoods, Gotti from Frazier in North Memphis and Dolph from Castellia Heights in South Memphis, there initially seemed to be no animosity between the two. In fact, when Dolph began his career, Gotti appeared to be supportive of his fellow Memphis artists. Gotti even shared his last text message to Dolph on the Breakfast Club when he allowed Charlemagne to read it. However, conflicts did emerge between the two, and the cause for the dispute varies greatly depending on who you ask. According to Yo Gotti, he's unsure of the origins of their issues, but speculates that it might be related to a verse that Dolph wanted him to do that he says he never did. I don't really understand it, you know what I'm saying? Like, if we talking like theories or, or, or like, I guess we all wondering like what it is or we talking facts, like the facts is, me and home never had one argument. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Ever in life. Mm -hmm. The facts is just, I'm the biggest rapper from Memphis. You know what I mean? I help a lot of rappers from Memphis. He, he was trying to get a verse or something from me, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I don't know if I, you know, probably didn't do that. I never done the verse, but I don't know. Maybe I didn't do the verse in time, I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. but, Yo Gotti's account of what ignited the feud differs from Young Dolph's, of course. Dolph mentioned on several occasions the reason for the disagreement. He claimed that when he gained popularity in 2012, Yo Gotti approached him and proposed signing him to a CMG record label. It's clear that Gotti genuinely appreciated Dolph's talent, as seen in this video where they performed together. Even though Gotti expressed enthusiasm in signing Dolph, Dolph revealed that he declined the deal with Gotti, and this marked the beginning of increased tensions between them. However, that wasn't the only reason. He said the deal probably would have gotten done, except when Gotti approached him, Gotti started throwing his other artist under the bus in an effort to persuade him to sign, with Gotti telling Dolph that all of his other artists constantly needed help and money and all of these other things, but Dolph didn't. He felt like this was Gotti basically dissing his own artist in an effort to get him to sign. And if he was willing to do that to his own artist, why would Dolph want to be one of them? It was because of this that he decided he didn't want to do business with Gotti. You did this all by yourself or did there were there other artists that kind of helped help open the doors for you? Like I know Gotti's opening the doors for a lot of artists in Memphis and or did you just been finding navigating your own path? I've been doing this man, on my own since day one. Day one. You know what I'm saying? Since day one, like everybody, a lot of folks, 
A lot of people, everybody almost done came to me with different situations like, man, let me help you with this and do this and do that. But me in my position, like I got too much of my own money tied in this and too much of my own time in it. Like I got yeah. too much invested in it. Mm -hmm. You feel what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. like, say like, guy that like, guy that wanted me to do the, like, man, come on, bro, let's do CMG paper route. That's cool. I'm knocking for that. If I was him, I would have came to me like that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But. Only thing was going to happen behind it was people like, oh, he popped off because of got it. You yeah. feel what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Which I can't do that because I got too much of my own time and money invested mm -hmm. in it. You mm -hmm. feel what I'm saying? So I guess it was something about a feature. Like, oh, I ain't do it. He didn't do a feature or something for me, right? Mm -hmm. You said he asked you for, he, you asked him for a feature. And Listen, he man, on um, my little boy and my little girl, man, he come to me talking about let him get on, on the song. Know what I mean? Why you want me to get on this song? So, so, I'll send it to me. Send me the song with the open verse. On top of that, it's like the first time I even met Lil Dude, go in the studio. First time. Man tell me, he sent everybody out the studio. Like, let me holler at dog. Like, man, you got your own everything, bro. You, you popping, you like, but you got the money, you got your team, you got this, you got that. You're like, bro, I'm telling you, we can, we can do this, we can do that. I ain't gotta hold your hand like Starlito. I ain't gotta babysit you like them. I'm like, okay, that's cool, but. In my first time meeting you, you gonna really sit and downplay your orders and throw your orders upon the bus to try to persuade me in to come over there? No, it's just, I can't respect that. Mm -hmm. Now I mean, like, I'm not finna get rid of throw none of my orders upon the bus to persuade somebody else. That, I'm, that just ain't where I come from. That ain't how I was raised. That ain't how, that ain't what I respect, no, none of that. You know what I'm saying? So, no, it ain't no issue. It ain't no mm -hmm. beef. It ain't no nothing. It's just, uh, a whole lot of misunderstanding and some stuff I don't respect, so. In 2010, Yo Gotti was gaining significant traction in the mainstream music scene. His song Five Star, featuring Gucci Mane, Trina, and Nicki Minaj, was climbing the charts, and it seemed like Memphis had a rising star in the midst. As for Young Dolph, he was just beginning his musical journey in 2010, having released his second mixtape, Welcome to Dolph World. By 2012, he was catching the attention of artists like Gucci Mane's 2 Chainz, OJ the Juice Man, and others from Atlanta, gradually building up his buzz like we discussed earlier. Yo Gotti was not only a prominent figure for Memphis too, but also in the entire music industry he was pretty prominent. As Young Dolph's star began to rise, Yo Gotti took notice. By August of 2012, Gotti invited Dolph to join him in that show that we watched a little bit earlier. Both artists were becoming increasingly influential in the world of music, and their collaboration seemed like a natural fit. It was right here, at this moment in time, that Yo Gotti extended the offer for Young Dolph to sign with his record label CMG. Yo Gotti later revealed that his last conversation with Young Dolph occurred on August 24, 2012, and to the public's knowledge, they didn't engage in any further discussions after that date. Although it initially appeared that Yo Gotti and Young Dolph were on good terms, their relationship would gradually deteriorate through indirect jabs that they were throwing. On October 15, 2013, Young Dolph released a new mixtape titled South Memphis Kingpin. Track 6, called Scared of Me, featured the first veiled attack. Doing all that tricking on it. <laughs> y'all can stop sweating. I ain't gonna say y'all, man. Nah. <laughs> the screens know what's up. They know y'all lying. These lyrics were a direct jab at Gotti, with Dolph insinuating that he had had relations with Yo Gotti's baby mama. Tensions between Yo Gotti and Young Dolph started to simmer behind the scenes, prompting Dolph to address the situation through his music. On July 8, 2014, Young Dolph released a new mixtape, High Class Street Music for American Gangster. In his song, What's Poppin', he addressed Yo Gotti, stating that there were no issues between the two. Despite this assertion, their relationship remained strained. Everybody keep asking what's up with me and Yo Gotti. What? Getting money, they getting money. That's the end That's of that. the end of that, bro. <laughs> Y'all know how this meant to be. In the following months, the rift between Young Dolph and Yo Gotti continued to grow. In December of 2014, during a visit to a radio station, Young Dolph was questioned about the escalating tensions with Yo Gotti. He responded by basically saying, hey, I choose not to sign with this label, and that's what it is. I'm my own man, I'm building my own legacy, and we're moving forward from that situation. The thing with me and Yo Gotti, like, Yo Gotti came to me, he wanted to do a situation, he was like, man, let's do the paper route CMG thing, you feel me? I'm a hustler. You feel me? For anything, bro, I'm a man and I'm a hustler. So I don't knock you for that. But if I was you, I would've tried to do that. You feel me? But at the same time, I'm a hustler, I'm a man, and after that, 
bro, I'm a, I'm a real. All I know how to do is keep it real. So, just like I said, bro, if I was you, I'd try to do that too. But at the same time, if you like, bro, you straight and you, how you rock with me, how you showing you rock with me, I ain't, I ain't tripping, bro. You doing, you got your own paper. You got your own team. You doing it. I mean, I still, I, I want to see you turn up, go on do your thing. You feel what I'm saying? Like, it ain't, it ain't like that anymore I'm from. You feel me? Like, every man for they self, which is cool. It's fine and dandy with me. But, you know what I'm saying? Like, man, I look at the big picture of everything. And things continue to escalate. On February 28, 2015, a CIAA event was disrupted by a shooting. As time went on, this incident became a critical turning point in the conflict between Young Dolph and Yo Gotti. During that fateful night, two individuals were injured by gunfire at the CIAA gathering. The venue was hosting a CIAA weekend takeover party that was featuring prominent rappers like T.I., Young Jeezy, and Joe Gotti and Young Dolph were also supposed to be there. While it remains unclear whether the artists were present during the shooting, videos on Instagram show panicked attendees fleeing the club with some ducking for cover or climbing over railings. It didn't take long for people to start figuring out what really happened. Shortly after the news broke, outlets started picking up the stories and people quickly discovered that Dolph was indeed the target of this attack. At 10, more than 100 shots fired on a busy uptown street. Witnesses terrified with bullets missing some people by just inches. Blake, police told me they've had a hard time getting potential witnesses to talk, even though hundreds of people were out here last night. Police said suspects fired at least 100 gunshots in the middle of North Caldwell Street, where hundreds partied in a nearby tent with dozens of homes front and center and innocent drivers like this one. They're scary. Caught in the crossfire. All of a sudden I seen bullets flying off the pavement. The woman who asked us not to show her face said she was traveling with her 92 year old grandmother and the two dodged bullet after bullet terrified. And tonight, several neighbors told me that police have also offered counseling to some of the children who were at home when all this happened. So far, police have not made any arrests in this case. Almost instantly after it happened, Dolph took to Twitter and posted a tweet that said you lose with a laughing emoji. A few weeks later, he did an interview where he downplayed the whole situation, refused to acknowledge that Gotti played any type of role in it at all, and referred to it as nothing more than entertainment. I just come out here and have fun. You know what I mean? Come out here to have fun, get my vibe on, you know what I mean? And do my thing. I let just come out here just straight for that. That's old news. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's old. What you talking about? <laughs> I don't know what you talking about. It's entertainment. You know what I'm saying? Like, definitely, if it ain't nothing else, it's entertainment right now. And this is the entertainment business, so I ain't on nobody's side. It's entertainment though, everybody watching. A whole lot what you see going on right now is coming out of Memphis and all that like, shit, this, you got Dolph all over it. However, as time went on, people would begin to piece things together and as it turns out, only one day before this incident where Dolph barely escaped death, he dropped a diss record to Yo Gotti titled Play With Your Chick, where he again talked about having a relationship with Yo Gotti's baby mama. He even went as far as to hire a Yo Gotti lookalike for the music video, he quit with his CMG shirt and everything, just to make sure that there wasn't no confusion about who he was dissing. Hurt your end, show your last two mixtapes. I hear you slick dissing, but that shit lying. All that make believe rapping about kind. Don't play with me, ho. Got it, you a hoe, man. Hey, you went from my biggest fan to my biggest hater. Begging me to sign with you, but I had too much paper. You make the city look bad. That's the truth. I be in North Memphis more than you. <laughs> was talking about me in your song prior to the side. Damn. Found my number in her phone and it hurt your pride. I'm sorry. So, so I told myself a long time ago, right? I said, I ain't gonna, I ain't, I ain't gonna expose this man, because we from the same city. You know, and your whole bad team know, I've been sparing your for the past five years. You know that, man, come on, man. I know, you know, the whole motherfucking city know, use the streets know that, stay on my way. Following this incident, Young Dolph escalated the situation by subtly targeting Yo Gotti and his music some more. On October 8, 2015, Young Dolph released a new mixtape, which took the industry by storm. And in the title track, he referenced Yo Gotti's baby mama again. Guess who baby mama DM me said you the shit. Oh. 
bro. I would tell you, but I'm always starting sh Yo Gotti became aware of the situation and decided that he was gonna respond. On November 27, 2015, he released a track called Legendary, in which he addressed Young Dolph's negative remarks. You really hate me about the bitch, my nigga, that's some other shit. How you gonna be legend when you're doing legendary sucker? Not long after, Young Dolph responded to the legendary track, but this time not through music. He chose to make a statement with his album cover by naming it King of Memphis, a title previously used by other Memphis rappers such as 8Ball and MJG. However, Yo Gotti was the most notable artist using that title at that time. He even included it in his official Twitter bio. Young Dolph's decision to use the title for his album was a direct challenge to Yo Gotti's claim. To further provoke Yo Gotti, Young Dolph announced that his album King of Memphis would be released on February 19th of that year, the same day as Yo Gotti's album was set to drop. This move by Young Dolph generated controversy and excitement among fans who were eager to see which artist was truly the king of Memphis. The competition between the two rappers intensified with supporters on both sides passionately debating who was the superior artist and who had more of a significant impact on the city of Memphis. Only two days after he announced his album title and release date, Dolph dropped a tweet that said bro went from being my number one fan and wanting to sign me to being my biggest hater. Hashtag facts. Since Young Dolph had openly mentioned Yo Gotti's interest in signing him, many people believe it was a direct taunt aimed at Gotti. Gotti seemed to respond to this assumption the very next day on his Twitter account tweeting, We can't afford to shoot and miss, consistently making shots. Hashtag Gotti Nation. However, this tweet was later removed, causing fans to speculate even more about the growing tension between the two rappers. After releasing his debut album, King of Memphis, on February 19, 2016, Young Dolph went on a promotional tour to support the album. Throughout this tour, he made several remarks aimed at Yo Gotti. One such instance happened on February 24, 2016, when he appeared on Hot 97 and disclosed that Yo Gotti had been texting him continuously for two years. It ain't no pressure with me, you know what I'm saying? Cause it's like, like people don't understand, like everybody on the outside looking in. Mm -hmm. Yo Gotti was texting my phone for two years straight. It's more, it's deeper than, it ain't just in the music and the rap, like his, 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 the, the, one of the men that was around him, you know what I'm saying? They like kind of raised him a little bit. He from my hood. So you guys are connected. See what I'm saying? Ways. Like exactly, like it ain't even like the music. Like this, yes, yeah. this small. You feel what I'm saying? Like yeah. I'm talking about, like literally, like we, like the one that raised him. That's my dad, best friend, cousin. You yeah. <laughs> know what I'm saying? So it's like, you know what I mean? It like it's really like I don't. I, I just laugh at it. A few days later, Young Dolph appeared on the Breakfast Club and discussed transforming his fans into haters. Just two days afterwards, on February 28, 2016, the CIAA event took place again. As you may recall, in 2015, two people were shot at this event, which both Yo Gotti and Young Dolph attended. In 2016, the very next year, things escalated when 40 to 50 shots were fired at Young Dolph's Sprinter van. Although his manager was in the vehicle, Young Dolph was not in it. It became apparent who the intended target was that night though. Security guards witnessed a Nissan Altima speeding away from the scene shortly after the 40 to 50 shots were fired into the Hyatt Hotel lobby and two occupied vehicles around 4.45 a.m. Eventually, three suspects were arrested that night, Howard Wright, Kevin Thompson, and Derek Bolton. They faced charges of three counts of shooting into an occupied dwelling and discharging a firearm within city limits. What caught most people's attention about this arrest was the fact that Howard Keon Wright, who was 31 years old at the time, was identified as both Yo Gotti's road manager and vice president of CMG Records. Young Dolph went on stage after all of this in a bold move and performed his Yo Gotti dish record at the whole crowd. With this official link between Yo Gotti and Young Dolph's feud, it became clear that their conflict extended beyond music and diss tracks and was going into real street issues. In 2018, 
Two of the three individuals were charged with multiple offenses, such as discharging a firearm into an occupied property, discharging a firearm into an occupied dwelling, misdemeanor carrying a concealed gun, and other related crimes. Yo Gotti's manager, Keon Wright, received a sentence of 10 to 14 years in prison and remains in custody to this day for the incident. Following these developments, both law enforcement and the public recognized that Yo Gotti and Young Dolph's situation was headed in the wrong direction. The rivalry between the two camps intensified on social media. On March 2, 2016, Black Youngster, a CMG artist affiliated with Yo Gotti, called out Young Dolph on Instagram and even went to his old hood. Hey man, I'ma keep the G, bro. Dolph, you a you a soft ass, you nice ass. If you got a problem, say you got a problem. Shake it. He ain't no more king of me. He ain't king of South Memphis. He ain't from the city. Bitch, Dolph, where you at, Dolph? Where you at? Where you at? Where you at? We ain't catch stage right now. We just left the stove. Where you at right now, Dolph? Where you at right now? Where you at? Where you at? Where we at right now, cuz? We ain't catch stage right now, cuz. What Dolph at, cuz? Where you at, cuz? Where you at? Where you at right now? Where you at? A few weeks later, Gotti found himself in an interview on Tim Westwood TV, and Tim directly asked Gotti what was really going on, a question that Gotti clearly tries his best to dodge. What the f is going on with Dolph, baby? What is going on with I'm, Black Youngster? What is going on, man? I know, Poppy, man. <laughs> that is no, crazy, no, man. That video was scary. Yeah. Yeah, I think they, this is probably a little misunderstanding. They know really pop. I mean, it looked crazy on World Star. Yeah, I, 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 caught, I caught it uh, a little bit of, but you know, the homie, uh, the homie Young, though. You know what I'm saying? The hmm. homie Young and, and Wild in the, in, in the streets and all. Um, you know, they just move. They just move a little different. It's so you know me, me like the shit I have going on and the shit I'm dealing with on a day to day. The paper's so big, the vision so big that like. This should be below my vision, mm. you know what I'm saying? This should be below my vision, but little homie, you know, I'm always little homie on the team, so I'm always give them, you know, the proper advice. I don't move like that, so so I'm always tell not only him but any youngin, like you know what I mean? Don't really handle your business like in the in the in the like that, you know what I'm saying? We got too much paper to get. I don't know, man. It's a little self snitching sometimes. Yeah, it, it, it ain't, it ain't, it ain't really worth it. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I think he get it though. Afterwards, on March 15, 2016, rapper Trouble unveiled his remix for his song "Ready" that featured Young Dolph. In Young Dolph's verse, he subtly targets Yo Gotti and CMG again. In this nigga that record when it's time for gangster shit, he the police. Facts. And I your boss man, baby mama, same hotel for four weeks. Black Youngster quickly catches wind of the remix, and on March 16, 2016, he releases a direct diss track towards Young Dolph called Shake Song. A Dolph Thor wanna play ho. I'm on tour with the K ho. You the king of Memphis, you ain't from the city, you from Chicago. Boy, you better lay low. Young Dolph addresses this head on via Instagram. Hey, I've been spraying your for years in the whole city, know that. Ho Gotti, you was a. I just got back to the city. They say you trying to put charges on me and put the police on me. You send your little do all your talking. Talk for yourself. Hey, that big head down syndrome looking motherfucker hate on everybody from the city that gets some real money. You start off hating on three six. They were having Oscars and you had to hate because you were broke. Because that's the only way you can get attention, boy. You were broke, boy. Now you hating on dog. You a <laughs> hey man, if I was your boy, I'd be mad at me too, man. Why you, why you mad at me? Cause your is on fake watch buses and you had to fake it till you make it. And I came in the game rocking real ice driving coops and shit. And Dolph don't let up. On March 28, 2016, he throws shade at Yo Gotti again and Black Youngster while he was on stage. So check this out. Y'all go right at the Look dude, the little one, the little dude, look broke, little peewee. I don't even know this shit. But it's Boston. That shit is bad. He just made it come. Hey, baby mama, this all that shit is. Uh -huh. Hey, trust, look to the mother. Tell my little y'all the devil, man. King of England in the streets right now. He running. How does your boy, man? Go! Uh-huh! Tell this mother, get it. Baby mama, my 
<laughs> now after this, it seemed like the tension had eased up for a little while. However, on June 27, 2016, Black Youngster decides he's gonna perform his diss track, Shake Something, live on stage. A few days later, on July 3rd, 2016, Black Youngster announces the end of his beef with Young Dolph, admitting that the conflict cost him a considerable sum of money. As far as the beef, now nah, I'm past this. I'm mean, like, I'm over this. Like, it ain't nothing, you know. I lost a half a million with just just doing boot bush. Not just that, just it lost. You know what I'm saying? Lost a lot of money. And the mother wanna come see it all talk and buy me all this shit. I don't give a fuck though, but you know, we still cool, but like, yeah, but nah, I ain't stunned that bitch. I'm gonna get money. What's I, and I, hope, I wish everybody else well who get their money. On August 29, 2016, while promoting his own work, Young Dolph appeared on Sway in the morning and discussed his issues with black youngster. Little dude don't even know me. Okay. Know what I'm saying? Like he ain't got no issues with me. That ain't nothing but his boss sending him out to do that. His boss wanted to make him like Young Dolph, but you never be a Young Dolph because Young Dolph a self-made millionaire in real life and would never ever got no help from nobody. You see what I'm saying? Right. So, you know what I mean? If you ain't got no haters, you is not popping. Later, on September 9, 2016, Black Youngster was interviewed and surprisingly decided he was going to praise Young Dolph, stating that he should have been on the Double XL freshman cover. But it's, I think it's a Memphis thing because I didn't even see Dolph on there. Dolph should have been on there. Long time ago. Mm. So, yeah, I feel like me personally, I feel like I'm putting enough work to where when, when, when he was doing it, when they were sending them out, he should have been on one of them covers. Mm. I'm putting a lot of work. Now, now nah, he don't need to be on there because he, like, he ain't no fresh no more. You know what I'm saying? Like, he deserve it, bro. And, and I feel like any from Memphis is doing it, bro. I salute him, bro. I don't care who you is. I can not like it. I can like it. You can be high. You can be a sucker. If you're from Memphis, you ripping Memphis, bro. I'm That's rocking. Really I'm, I'm rocking with it. You know what I'm saying? I, I feel like you still deserve your shot just like I deserve mine. You know what I'm saying? However, just a week later, Young Dolph dismissed the entire interview and seemed uninterested in Black Youngster's compliment. I don't want to talk about the hood, man. <laughs> what about the double XL? You know what I'm saying? Like, it ain't even, it's, it's all that shit fake. You know what I'm saying? A little dude don't even know me, so all that shit fake. He on, he can't conversate about me. He could just let him do his, do what he whatever he's doing, you know what I mean? The thing is, Dolph and Yo got it, you know what I mean? He trying to run, Yo got it trying to run and put his artists out there, you know what I mean? Let him use my name to build him up some buzz and all that fake but I don't want to talk about that, bro. In October of 2016, Yo Gotti became even more entangled in the feud with Young Dolph. Yo Gotti released a collaborative mixtape with Moneybag Yo called Two Federal. In the intro track called Can't Do It, he takes jabs at Young Dolph. Let me set the record straight. I am the king, I ain't got the hate. Got it. Every around me that ate the other nigga just a minute. Me, I watch his interviews, don't like his energy. A few months passed, and on December 23rd, 2016, Yo Gotti unveiled his White Friday CM9 mixtape. In the intro track, 81, he covertly disses Young Dolph once again. Hey, got the city divided, y'all. Yeah. Bring it together, I tried it, y'all. Yeah. I tried it, yeah. I tried it. I'm the king, you hiding yeah. it. You want a problem, I'm fine yeah. I was too busy, get too many million right now, be perfect time. Yeah. Let the little say that what they do the best. I don't be tripping at all. Whatever come with it, I'm with it, little I swear I'm good for it all. Naturally, after Yo Gotti's two veiled shots in his mixtapes intros, Young Dolph started to catch on. On February 1st, 2017, he fired back directly at Yo Gotti with his scathing diss track, Play With Your Chick. The track escalated the feud by targeting not only Yo Gotti, but also his older brother, his baby mama, and the entire CMG label, and more. Then, on February 2nd, 2017, Young Dolph released his new mixtape, Gelato, with the title track, also dissing Yo Gotti. When I'm beefing, I don't squash it. Oh, rapper from the other side of town was hating, so I f the baby mama, now he's sick. Following the mixtape's release, Young Dolph went on a promotional tour giving interviews that took shots at Yo Gotti and explaining why he decided to diss him. I really have been sparing him for the past um, years on top of years on top of years, but like like recently, my little homies and different people had like, you know what I'm saying, come around me like, bro, you heard, you heard such and such, you heard his new mixtape? Oh, you heard, you heard his new I'm like, no, I don't listen to, I don't listen to that music. I don't mm -hmm. listen to the music. I don't, 
I don't listen to a lot of people's music. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Especially not this sucker. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Man, they play it. So, what, so his last two mixtapes, he trying to slick this Dolph, trying to throw. It's like you playing. You know what I'm saying? So you want to play? I ain't finna play how you want to play. We're going to play how I want to play. I'm finna get ready to go and expose you and let, everything, let the facts be out here. Facts on top of facts. And that's why he can't. He don't even know how to respond. Because it ain't no responding. It ain't no responding. What you going to say? Mm. The whole city know the truth. It's a different when you just got all oh, this one person over here. He 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 saying this. He saying that. All this about you versus our oh, bro. That whole city say this about y'all. That's the truth. The whole city. Man, come on, dog. On February 12, 2017, the internet trolled a bunch of hip hop blog sites into believing Yo Gotti responded to Young Dolph with a track titled "Don't Beef with Me." This track actually wasn't an official response track at all. This track was actually titled "Prayers." The crazy thing is, it was just a troll. Then on February 26, 2017, the CIAA event took place again for the third time. This time, somebody pulled up and let off over a hundred shots. I said, I seen him pull off right yeah, here. Yeah, pull off right here. Bro, a truck, came, a truck came from right here, pulled up, and slammed on brakes. Break. And like a moving, bro. Yeah, and they start right shooting, there. and they're, they're backing up. They put a car on the truck and reverse. Oh, that's they start backing yeah, up. Yeah, they're backing up. I saw them. Oh, they're no, 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 but it's a bulletproof vent. It's That's a bulletproof vehicle. Right yeah, yeah, bulletproof. Yeah, what bulletproof vehicle. Nothing bulletproof. Yeah, truck yeah, bulletproof, bro. That ain't no bullet. Yeah, he said the truck bulletproof. Luckily, the SUV that Young Dolph was in was bulletproof, and Dolph didn't get hurt in the incident. But the shooters were able to get away that night. Dolph started trolling the shooters, and on April 1st. He dropped a new album that was titled Bulletproof. On the track list of his Bulletproof album, Young Dolph is trolling the whole situation. I talked about it earlier, how the track list was basically a sentence about the 100 shots that was let off. Anyways, on this album, he had a track titled 100 Shots that was also making fun of the whole situation and essentially dissing Yo Gotti, CMG, and Black Youngster. Everybody screaming, gang, gang, gang. Those folks come and get you, you gon' tell on the whole gang. A hundred shots. A hundred shots. A hundred shots. How the f you miss a whole hundred shots? They been waiting on this gangster to drop. Even though they wish I could be stopped. Yo Gotti decided to perform on April 16, 2017 in Kentucky. And after his performance at the end, he says, you'll never see me beef on the internet, we pull up. A lot of people assume that this was a shot at Young Dolph, but then a couple of weeks later, on May 7, 2017, Yo Gotti denied that there was any beef at all between him and Young Dolph. Yo Gotti don't be in situations. <laughs> Yo Gotti get money. Yo Gotti help artists come up and build careers for their family. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yo Gotti helps young cats from the hood change their life. Yo Gotti don't be in situations. Then a couple of weeks later, on May 16, 2017, the police issued a warrant for a black youngster and two other men. They both ended up surrendering that day in Charlotte after the warrants were issued. They were officially being accused of having something to do with the hunter shots that were let off back in February of 2017 at the CIAA event, resulting in this legendary clip right here of black youngster telling the news crew, that obviously somebody was snitching on him. I ain't fired nothing. I don't know nothing. I don't know nothing. I ain't seen nothing. I ain't do nothing. Benson's attorney says the rapper turned himself in today because police found a van that was involved in the shooting. The attorney tells Channel 9 Benson rented the van, but then it was stolen from him. Somebody, it's obviously somebody writing. Somebody snitching. Black youngster was released on bail the same day that he was arrested, but his attorney admitted that the van that was used in the shooting of Young Dolph was rented by Black Youngster, but then he says that it was stolen. So he wants y'all to believe that one of Young Dolph's ops rented a van, got the van stolen, and the people who stole it used that van to go shoot at Black Youngster's op. Yeah, okay. Anyways, according to the article, Youngster rented the van, which was later found to have been used in the shooting that involved 100 bullets being fired. Black Youngster faced six counts of discharging a firearm into an occupied property 
and one count of felony conspiracy. Interestingly enough, his lawyer stated that it was Young Dolph's bulletproof mixtape that led the police to issue the arrest warrant for a black youngster. The attorney said, and I quote, Memphis-based rap artist Black Youngster has turned himself in on charges filed in Charlotte, North Carolina. The warrant served were based on lyrics from rapper Young Dolph's bulletproof mixtape. Youngster will await arraignment while he maintains innocence and no involvement with the incident. End quote. On May 18, 2017, the day after, Black Youngster released a response track to Young Dolph's bulletproof mixtape called Birthday. In this song, he accuses Young Dolph of snitching due to several statements that he made in the Bulletproof mixtape. I'm not guilty. I'm innocent. I'm not guilty. A Dolph Thorne wanna see me dead and gone. Gang. This a red tear 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 song. Gang. Drop that Bulletproof and made a statement. Red and that you dead wrong. Snitched on their song. Gang. Talking to everybody and gossiping on their phone. I gotta play safe out here. A Dolph Thornton got me trying to be the case out here. Tell the whole world how you caught around and see the head of free Come and tell me you sorry. Ho. Tell your fans the truth. Tell them how you really wasn't trapping you with nothing but a bar. Ho. Tell them how daddy yo used a little boy you make it run to the stove for a cigar and water. Ho. Tell them how we had a show together you ain't come in cause you thought I was gonna rob you. You the owner come to CIW today with a Budaboo truck. Scared for your life. How you gonna go and shoot your own truck up and play dead for the night? Gang, gang. And then press charges on me and tell the police I did that shit. Gang, gang. Now the feds say that I'm a menace. This for all the young innocent. Uh, I'm innocent. Uh, if Dolph show up in court, my need gonna sentence me. On my paperwork, they got the name and their sentences. You little rat ass bitch. Know what I'm saying? Your whole clique. I go to what all you bitches. P.R.E. Rat entertainment. All you bitch. Your whole clique. You ain't no more the motherfucking barber. You know the motherfucking world. You, you heard the motherfucking long, big, dirt ass shirts. You know what I'm saying? Cook good her and shit. Her out on your shirts and shit. You little junk ass. Hey, ho. In the end, the 100 shot shooting didn't lead to any convictions as the charges against black youngster were dropped in May 2019, about two years later, due to lack of evidence. After hearing the news, Young Dolph mocked black youngster on Instagram on May 28, 2017, for foolishly using a rental car during the drive by shooting. <coughs> hey, I just rented him off van in my name, right? You know what I'm saying? And we finna go dump on it, and we finna jump out six deep. A hundred shots. <laughs> dump my head. <laughs> <laughs> if we get caught, I know one of y'all snitch. Even though this my name, no dumb as a mother. <laughs> no. I think I'm just gonna send my little they don't do this Y'all can take the van, though. I got the van to my name. I'm on my way. All right. <laughs> How the f you miss a whole hundred shots? Stupid ass. A few months passed without any further incidents between the two parties. However, on September 27, 2017, Young Dolph was shot in Los Angeles. Good evening, I'm Rick Garcia. And I'm Pat Harvey. Breaking news, a shooting at a popular tourist spot in Hollywood. Tonight, a rapper is in critical condition. It happened just after one this afternoon in front of the Lowe's Hotel at the Hollywood and Highland Complex. And CBS 2's Dave Lopez is live in Hollywood with more information. Dave. Right in front of where that shooting took place, we can't tell you the rapper's real name is Adolf Thornton. He comes out of Memphis. He's been a big star on the rap scene since 2014. He goes by the name of Young Dolph is his rapper name. He is in critical condition, according to the LAPD, but not life-threatening injuries. He apparently is either still in surgery or about to get out of surgery after being shot numerous times in the upper body right across the street. And they say it could be back to, it could go connected to a feud that rapper, rap groups are having, the feud that goes all the way back Back to February. Everybody screaming, gang. This is 32 year old rapper Young Dolph, whose latest album is entitled Bulletproof, and one of the songs on that album, 100 Shots. And detectives say just before 1 o'clock this afternoon, he was shot. Detectives say three men approached him right in front of Lowell's Hollywood Hotel today, where all four were guests. There was a fight, Young Dolph fell to the ground, 
and that's when one of the three suspects opened fire. No idea what the altercation was about, what the verbal fight was about. Not at this point. It just sounds like it escalated from a back and forth sort of argument. Seven months ago in North Carolina, after a concert, young Dolph had his SUV shot up. Police say nearly 100 bullets were fired into his SUV. He was not in it. Allegedly, there was a feud with another rapper. Detectives say much of what happened today is all caught on security cameras from the hotel. After young Dolph was shot, he staggered into this nearby shoe store and the three suspects fled on foot, even though they arrived, according to police, in this gold-colored SUV. Was the victim armed? No. Not that we're aware of. We haven't found a handgun. Nobody said he was armed. Video surveillance does not show that. Police say the three suspects are still on the loose. However, about two blocks away from the shooting, they did detain three men. Two of them, we are told, have been released, but this man remains in police custody and is still being questioned. The shooting occurred just off Hollywood Boulevard, near the intersection of Hollywood and Highland, where tourists flocked by the thousands. Again, no one else was shot except the rapper, and three suspects remain on the loose. De detectives just confirmed me that young Dolph uh, was going into the hotel when he uh, was confronted by these three men who happened to be, in their words, a rival group, a rival group in the rap world. Again, they would not give us details how this and the shooting back in uh, the Carolinas is connected, although they say they are looking at the possibility that the two are related. They would not give any other details other than the fact that even though he's listed as critical, he's expected to survive the number of shots that he took. Yo Gotti was officially named a person of interest by the police and a man named Corey McLendon was detained near the scene. McLendon was an associate of Yo Gotti as evidenced by photos of him with Yo Gotti and wearing Yo Gotti's labels, CMG t-shirts. Ultimately, McLendon was released the next day, September 28th, due to insufficient evidence. This marked the third time someone connected to Yo Gotti was involved in a shooting incident that targeted young Dolph. On October 13, 2017, Young Dolph was released from the hospital and had a message for the shooter. Hey, we at the m in the hospital, Jack. Got me. Y'all know what time me this right here don't stop. Legendary. For a couple of years after this, neither party made any significant public statements about each other, although there were occasional disses in interviews. Then, on May 15, 2019, Yo Gotti's tour bus was shot up after a concert in Nashville. It's rapper Yo Gotti's tour bus hit by gunfire overnight in Nashville. Police say no one was on the bus when it was shot up around 11 last night, so no one was hurt. They say the gunfire appears to be targeted vandalism, and no word yet on a possible shooter. The article also linked the incident to the past issues between Yo Gotti and Young Dolph with the police believing that it was some type of retaliation from Young Dolph's camp. Time passed, and on January 31st, 2020, Yo Gotti released a new project called Untrapped. The title track seemed to reflect on his issues with Young Dolph. Where we start off, how we go wrong. Just wish it all to put a name in his song. Niggas fighting over blocks that we don't even own. On February 5th, 2020, Young Dolph's contentious song targeting Yo Gotti title Play With Your Chick achieved gold status. Young Dolph shared this news on social media, appearing to provoke Yo Gotti with this caption, which basically said, I smashed the rapper's chick and got paid for it. Later, on August 14, 2020, Young Dolph released his latest album, Rich Slave. The song, I See Money Signs from the album, includes more jabs at Yo Gotti. Then I Rapper, baby, mama, about mistake. Damn. Ever since then, that big head mother been hating. Yo Gotti didn't react to the insults, but his fellow artist Black Youngster did take action. On August 16, 2020, Black Youngster shared a video on Instagram in which he seen firing a random gun into the sky. He tagged Young Dolph in the caption, writing, Young Dolph, I'm with my gang. Don't get your shooter shot. Hashtag heavy camp. Hashtag super hot. 
Hashtag Super CMG. On August 18, 2020, just two days later, Young Dolph was promoting his album and appeared on the Breakfast Club radio show. When asked about Black Youngster's video, he simply replied by saying, who is that guy? Now, what's up? Why, why, is, why is Black Youngster still still coming at you, Dolph? I, I saw him post on Instagram. I don't even know who that is. Who is that? Okay. He did a video this weekend where he was shooting out of the window and he, he added you and said, well, my gang gonna get your shooter shot. I'm already fighting the case right now. Man, I ain't got time for nobody, no, no, like, man, they playing police games. I don't want to play police games. When you start playing police games, I exit myself out of the equation. Like, go play with the police. I'm not finna play with the police. Y'all already got me yet. Like, no, go bye-bye. Like. In 2021, the situation took a turn. On July 21st, 2021, Yo Gotti's artist ESTG released a track featuring Yo Gotti titled Run Into Me, where Yo Gotti seemingly takes subtle jabs at Young Dolph again. Smoke in the city, know that I ain't sleep. No she know it too, but he's still acting tough. Take care of the surgery. Get that boy tummy tough. Tragically, on November 17, 2021, Young Dolph was fatally shot in Memphis, Tennessee. Following the incident, some speculated that Yo Gotti may have been involved due to their past rivalry. The Memphis Police Department increased security around Yo Gotti's restaurant, fearing possible retaliation. As a result, Yo Gotti postponed his CM10 project. On December 12, 2021, Young Dolph was slated to perform at the 2021 Rolling Loud show, but his crew took his place after his passing. At the event, they played Young Dolph's diss track, Play With Your Chick, and a member of the PRE record label declared, This ain't O. Yo Dolph is here with us right now. I can hear him talking to him. You know what he just told me? What he said? He just told me. About a week and a half later, on December 20th, 2021, Black Youngster released a new track in a video titled I'm Assuming. In the video, he's seen at a graveyard, and one of the headstones in the background has the name Thornton visible on it. This detail caught people's attention as Young Dolph's real name is Adolph Thornton Jr. Many assumed this was a direct jab at Young Dolph. All that throwing them slick shots on the gram, that's how you end up dead. Ain't don't got no love for no... I want out with his head. Can't no get no by what you read. You know my eyes they bleed. I done bust out shots for other cause other was scared. I been a street that murdered the rap my second heart. I'm on the verse about the purse with the young they stacking bodies. Murder what she wrote. You play with me, you get murdered again. I dig your ass up and show your friend on some evil twin. You stop it right here. What? Let me out. Hey, no, no. You know I'm squeezing the whole trigger. You know how I come. You know I did this for you. Duh. Yeah. I'm on that same. Despite receiving backlash, Black Youngster stood by his actions in a lengthy Instagram post stating, I'm the type of dude who ain't never sat back and looked for nobody to feel sorry for me. I come from the heart of South Memphis where you get no sympathy. Don't even know what that is. With that being said, I could give two what the world think about me. It amazes me how just because I'm a multi-millionaire gangster that I'm put under this magnifying glass and every little thing I do, say, receives negativity, whether it's to be put out that way or not. I'm human, I ain't perfect. I go through stuff just like everybody else and a bunch of other stuff like that. As further developments unfolded, it became evident that Young Dolph's tragic fate was not connected to Yo Gotti or Black Youngster really at all. Instead, it was linked to an entirely separate issue that was taking place in the streets of Memphis. On January 5th, 2022, nearly three months after the passing of rapper Young Dolph, a significant development emerged in the case. Authorities announced their first suspect, 23-year-old Justin Johnson, a local rapper known as Straight Drop. Memphis police, U.S. Marshals, and the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation offered a combined reward of up to $15,000 for information that could lead to his arrest. Straight Drop faced a federal warrant for violating supervised release on previous weapon offenses 
and was added to Tennessee's most wanted list. Police in Memphis, Tennessee, releasing information about the suspect wanted for shooting and killing rapper Young Dolph. There is now a $15,000 reward on the table for anyone who can help lead authorities to this man. This is Justin Johnson. Police believe the 23-year-old was the shooter. They say Johnson has ties to gangs and should be considered armed and dangerous. Within a day of Young Dolph's death, a comedian named Darion Childs posted on Facebook expressing his love for Memphis and his gangster culture. However, just hours later, the 21-year-old was shot and killed at a gas station. The white Mercedes, used as a getaway car, was discovered days later near an abandoned house, linking it to a double shooting that had also occurred days before Dolph's death, where two women were shot multiple times and one died. Authorities confirmed that assault rifles were used in both murders. Soon after the vehicle was found, a man named Desmond Rogers was shot and killed next to the abandoned house, leading many to believe he informed the police about the car and they killed him because he snitched. Around this time, a now deleted music video of Straight Drop, aka Justin Johnson, rapping in front of the exact same abandoned house went viral. His associate, CEO Bobby, was thought to be the owner of the Mercedes and had appeared with the car in multiple photos in his now deleted Instagram. CEO Bobby, whose real name is Joshua Hewlett, was known to police as a shooter after he was arrested in 2020 for an incident involving an exchange of gunfire between two cars. Another associate named Jojo Splat was seen in front of Bobby's Mercedes as well, and a music video showed Jojo, CEO Bobby, and a man wearing a Bass Pro Shop hat similar to the one worn by the murder suspect. CEO Bobby was also seen wearing a PRE chain, the label owned by Young Dolph, which he allegedly obtained after a PRE member was stripped and robbed of it. You see that, they like them trying bought. Like, she got bought over here. Like, she got bought over here. Them whole legit family. Oh, That's a five finger discount off a rapper name. Off a rapper name. It's that one. The, 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 the fat one. It's that one. Later, it was discovered that the white Mercedes driven by the shooter was actually a stolen vehicle. Bobby found himself in handcuffs just a week after Dolph's demise, facing interrogation about the stolen vehicle. Police discovered weapons and drugs at his girlfriend's residence when they went to pick him up, igniting speculation that he was being probed in connection with young Dolph's passing. However, it eventually became evident that CEO Bobby had no real involvement, but merely wanted to show off and flex with a stolen car. Meanwhile, Cornelius Smith emerged as a second suspect, and he was identified as the thief of the white Mercedes after CEO Bobby was arrested, and a manhunt for him and Straight Drop commenced shortly after. Scrutinizing Straight Drop's past, People began to wonder how he was even free to participate in this crime in the first place, as he had previously been implicated in a separate shooting incident where three people were shot at a bowling alley. On July... Yeah, that 23-year-old spent several years in federal prison, but he was released pretty recently, actually, in May for good... On a music video that day and remain a fugitive, only to be caught... Upon an hour. Shortly after learning about Johnson, ABC 24 confirmed that a second man is now indicted for Dolph's murder, and it turns out he was already in custody for another crime. The Shelby County DA says 32 year old suspect Cornelius Smith is now facing first degree murder charges. He was actually arrested in South Haven back in December on charges of auto theft involving the same white Mercedes that was used in the murder of young Dolph. He is now being held at the Shelby County Jail without bond. Cornelius Smith, much like Johnson, also had previously been involved in another incident prior to this right here, leaving people to also wonder how he was free too. It really seems like the system in Memphis just doesn't work because in 2018, Cornelius Smith was arrested for aggravated kidnapping, aggravated assault, and domestic assault. On February 27, 2018, a woman reported being abducted days earlier by the father of her child, which was Smith. She explained that he had taken her to return a pair of shoes that they had bought, but instead of driving her home when they were going back, he continued past her street. Desperate, she tried to jump out of the vehicle, but the doors were locked. At that point, Smith brandished a silver and black handgun, threatening to splatter her brains on the window if she made another move, accusing her of cheating, and then struck her with the gun. Smith also threatened to murder her entire family, 
holding Neum responsible for her alleged cheating. He kept her captive in his home for three days before finally driving her to a street corner where she was able to contact the police. Mysteriously, this case just vanished. These were the first two people to be charged in the murder of Young Dolph, and since these guys didn't really seem to be tied to Yogati in any way at the time they were arrested, it led people to wonder who these guys were and what the reason was for them committing the murder in the first place. And that is where this story gets even deeper with even more of a backstory coming to light and even more people becoming connected to it. Whether Dolph realized it or not, he made some extremely dangerous enemies when he crossed paths with a group from Memphis known as the Trula Mafia, which included Justin Johnson. Just before Dolph's death, he had signed a rising rapper named Uncle Danny, who also goes by the name Big Unk. Street rumors suggest that Big Unk had killed another man from Memphis named D-Money, who was a key member of the Trula Mafia. This is where Dolph's problems really began. Ultimately, leading to his tragic demise. By signing Big Unk to his PRE record label, Dolph unknowingly took on any issues associated with him. The Trula Mafia has gained infamy on the streets of Memphis for their brutal crimes. Their alleged leader, CEO Teezy, has connections to CMG and Yo Gotti though. Yo Gotti's brother, Big Jook, was a known associate of Teezy, with footage of them together circulating online. However, it's not the only link between CMG and Trula Mafia. A third suspect, Shondell Barnett, was apprehended later but released due to a technicality and vanished and was believed to have been involved in the incident. People speculate that the core reason behind the conflict is the murder of D Money's brother, J Money, who was a promising rapper from Memphis and even had cosigns from people like Cheap Key. Dolph and J Money were supposedly close and many expected Dolph to support J Money's family after his death. However, after D-Money's murder, Dolph decided to sign Big Unk, who was rumored to have killed D-Money. The brother's mother even accused Dolph of siding with her son's killer on Facebook. This situation could explain why the Trula Mafia had issues with young Dolph in the first place. However, the case isn't that simple. Months after the arrest of these three suspects, another man, Hernandez Govan, was arrested in connection with the case. Authorities claim that Govan had ordered a hit on Young Dolph. At this point, it's unclear why Govan would have wanted Dolph dead, but he did have connections to the music industry. His daughter, whose name was Lotta Cash Desto, was signed to Lil Uzi Vert and was tragically murdered last year in Houston. Now, there's rumors suggesting that there might be some type of link between Dolph's death and her death, but there's no concrete evidence to support that theory, at least not at this point. All we know is that prosecutors are accusing Govan of paying for the hit. A third suspect has been indicted in connection to the murder of Memphis rapper Young Dolph. According to District Attorney Steve Moroy, they have now indicted the person they went to any details about the evidence. The truth is, there are still many unanswered questions surrounding Young Dolph's murder. The suspects have been in custody for almost a year, and the judge recently announced that the trial might not even begin until 2024. If convicted, these individuals could face some seriously lengthy prison sentences. Ultimately, countless videos online claim to know precisely what transpired in the case of Young Dolph. The fact remains that this is an ongoing investigation. And yes, while arrests have been made, no one's been convicted yet. However, it is likely that somebody will be convicted in time and witnesses will testify and when they do the full story will more than likely come to light potentially bringing justice to young Dolph and his family Dolph's influence extended beyond his music impacting the lives of those around him and the rap community as a whole after his death people began to discuss his character and his actions outside of his rap persona Dolph was known for his generosity investing in properties and giving his children houses for their birthdays he frequently organized giveaways in his hometown of Memphis and consistently supported charitable causes. Though his music portrayed street life, his actions beyond that reflected his true character. He advocated for independence, financial well-being, and mental stability. Dolph visited schools and talked with students about ensuring a bright future for themselves. These voluntary actions 
speak volume about who Dolph really was. Sadly, Dolph understood the risks of the life that he led. He respected his environment and he expected the same in return. But that's not how things work in the streets. Young Dolph was on the path to accomplishing great things had his life not been cut short. However, this doesn't diminish the positive impact that he did make while he was still here. But that's the whole story of Young Dolph. Now this was a lengthy piece to create, but to tell the truth you guys, I really enjoyed the process and I look forward to putting together another one for you guys here real soon. Anyways, that's it for the video guys. If you enjoyed the content, be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, tap the notification bell so you get notified every time I upload a video. As always, it's been fun rocking with y'all, man. I'm out.